About time I did this list. You know, sometimes I really think that gamers really do judge books, or rather games, by their cover. After all, for every praised hit and every mockable failure out there, there's always those games that are pushed aside for various reasons. Now when it comes to underrated games, it can be split into two separate categories, overhated games and overlooked games. And since a certain fiery joker already covered the former, I feel that someone should cover the latter. So that's exactly what I'm going to do. I'm here to count down the top 10 games that people didn't even give a fair chance and really needed one. Basic rules apply as per usual, one for franchise and only games I've played, and I'll try to limit spoilers. Not much else to say now, so let us commence! As you can tell from some of my previous work, I love racing games. They're easily some of my favorite games ever, and the Crash Bandicoot racing games are no exception. Well, that's kind of obvious since Crash Team Racing and Crash Tag Team Racing were in my top 15 racing games list. That being said, as much as I love these games, that doesn't mean I'm going to overlook Crash Nitro Kart. Released in 2003 for the PlayStation 2, GameCube, and Xbox, Crash Bandicoot was never really given a chance amongst gamers or Crash Bandicoot fans due to its quite apparent similarities to CTR. Now, I'm not going to deny the similarities between CTR and Nitro Kart. They both have similar stories, both have adventure modes that pretty much play exactly the same, amongst other things. But despite this, Crash Nitro Kart is still a very well-crafted game. The game still contains the classic frantic kart racing action that we all know and love, complete with multiplayer game modes to keep you coming back for more. This includes your usual single race, time trial, and cup race, but this also includes a deathmatch mode, last man standing, and even capture the flag. Heck, there's even a battle arena editor in the game. How cool is that? But easily the best part of the game is the level design. I mean, these tracks are some of the best I've ever seen in a racing game, and this is made even better by its zero gravity feature. In other words, on some tracks, your car becomes electromagnetic and can drive up walls and ceilings, leading to even more creative tracks. Gee, doesn't that sound familiar? My only real complaint with the game is that you have to 100% the adventure mode with both teams in order to unlock one of the playable characters, which sucks for completionists such as me. But I digress. It's still a really fun racing game that was overshadowed solely because of its precursor. In fact, I think it's time that we get a new Crash Bandicoot racing game. That doesn't count! Despite the uprising of motion controls on consoles nowadays, it's surprising that Dance Dance Revolution is still rather popular. But you want to know what's even more surprising? There was a DDR game with Mario in it, and pretty much no one even got it. Yeah, Dance Dance Revolution Mario Mix may seem like an obscure concept, but it's actually a very impressive game. For starters, the remix songs used in the game were extremely well made, ranging from classical music to fanfare Mario tunes to... Songs from Carmen? Yeah, I don't get it either. The story of the game is admittedly rather stupid. Yeah, there's a story mode in the game, but the story mode is fun nevertheless. And plus, Waluigi's finally the main villain in a Mario game! Or, technically. Not to mention, the game also includes some fun minigames that are so addicting they should be in Mario Party, and the mush mode really likes to twist things up to the max. Overall, it's quite unfortunate that this game got thrown aside. Oh, and did I forget to mention that you have a dance-off with Bowser while a metal remix of his Double Dash theme plays? Now, it's not really usual to have an overlooked Nintendo game, let alone an entirely overlooked Nintendo franchise, but such is the case with their series of logic puzzle games, Professor Layton. Now, I would put the entire series on this list, except I've only played one game in the series, so I'll just stick with that. And if you watched my Chrono Connects list, you would know that that Layton game is the third game, Professor Layton and the Unwound Future. It may seem blatantly obvious why I picked this Layton game out of all of them to play first, hint hint, I like time travel, but that doesn't matter. Unwound Future is one of, if not the best puzzle game I've ever played, and easily one of the best games I played in 2013. Despite being the third game in the series, it's actually the last game in the series chronologically, taking place after the events of Diabolical Box. In this game, the top hatted gentleman and his apprentice Luke find themselves traveling 10 years into the future to meet up with Luke's future self and help save future London from the reign of the evil mastermind... Layton? Yeah, that's all I'm going to say about the plot, because if I say anything else, that would definitely be spoiling the game. 
which is unfortunate because the story is easily the best part about this game. It's extremely well written, where pretty much every character, even the villains, are likable in some way, shape, or form. Other than a certain someone that I will not name. As for the gameplay itself, it's a point-and-click adventure containing numerous puzzles that will truly test your knowledge. For those who like logic puzzles, such as myself, you will love this game. Just saying. Another thing I enjoy about this game is the presentation and soundtrack. The art style in this game has quite a charm to it, and several franchises have tried to replicate it since, as you'll see later on this list. And as for the soundtrack, it's beautifully composed. Kudos to Tohomitu Nishiura for making this fantastic soundtrack. Honestly, I can't find anything else to talk about that wouldn't end up spoiling the game, so I'm just going to end on this note. Professor Layton and the Unwound Future is one of the best games available on the Nintendo DS, and it's sad that not many people gave it a chance because it's a puzzle game. You want to know what I find really laughable? How many people say that every single one of the Mega Man X games are exactly the same every time. And while that's true for the most part, they've obviously never heard of Mega Man X Command Mission, though it's to be expected. Due to it being an RPG, Command Mission was pushed aside by pretty much every Mega Man fan out there, except maybe the Battle Network fans, which is really sad because this is actually a really good RPG. Let's start with the story. The plot focuses on a maverick named Epsilon, who's currently causing a lot of ruckus in Giga City. So Maverick Hunter Commander Redup sends X, Zero, and a mysterious hunter named Shadow to stop them. This leads to one of X's most complex adventures yet, with several twists and turns along the way. Alongside X and Zero, you get a swell cast of characters in your party. There's the card-wielding bounty hunter Spider, the cowardly tank Massimo, the mysterious ninja Marino, the adorable healer replit Cinnamon, and the controversial protagonist of X7, Axel. No worries everyone, Axel's actually tolerable in this game. As for the gameplay, it plays a lot like a standard turn-based RPG, but with some extra variables to spice things up. For instance, every character has their own special ability to use in battle, and they all have a Mega Evolution style super form that boosts their stats. Not to mention, you can actually see the turn order! About freaking time! Another feature in this game that makes it stand out is the Force Metal system. Force Metal can be equipped onto your party members to increase their stats, but they are limited in order to keep things balanced. Add some fun boss fights and some catchy techno music, and you've got a game that really shouldn't have been thrown aside in favor of the other X games, including X7. And one final thing. Unlike the other X games, Sigma is nowhere to be found! Yes! Yes! Got no fame since you played, for the status quo. With most modern Sonic the Hedgehog games, like Sonic Unleashed and Shadow the Hedgehog, fans absolutely despise these games and insult pretty much anyone who gives a compliment to them. However, this is not the case with Sonic and the Black Knight. Fans didn't even give it a chance, which is sad because this game is actually really cool. Sonic and the Black Knight is the second game in the Sonic Storybook Saga, so in other words, it's a sequel to that terrible Sonic and the Secret Rings. But unlike Secret Rings, Black Knight is actually functional. It keeps the high-speed gameplay of previous games, but it also fuses this with hack-and-slash gameplay. Combine these two, and you have the fastest hack-and-slash game since Dynasty Warriors. Some may see this gameplay as repetitive or a button masher, but how can it be a button masher if it uses motion controls? Though in all honesty, the motion control is actually really responsive, despite what critics say. Then there's the story. The game takes place in the world of King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table. In this world, King Arthur has become corrupted by the immortal granting powers of Excalibur Scabbard and has become the Black Knight, leader of the Underworld forces. The sorceress Merlina summons Sonic into the world to help fight off the Black Knight with the usage of a talking sword named Caliburn. And with this blade, Sonic must take down both the Black Knight and his loyal servants, that being Lancelot, Gawain, and Percival, who are portrayed by Shadow, Knuckles, and Blaze, respectively. This leads to some epic boss battles against the Four Knights that test your skills of parrying and sword clashes. I would say more about the story, but that would be spoiling it. And with the twist present in the plot, I'd rather not. Then there's the presentation. While the graphics in-game aren't revolutionary, but they still look good, the cinematic cutscenes look gorgeous. And as for the music, it's one of the best soundtracks in the entire franchise. Honestly, there's not much left to say. It's a very self-explanatory game, but enjoyable nonetheless. Now if you excuse me, I'm gonna go fight the knight. You know, sometimes having a big-name company advertise the heck out of a critically acclaimed game isn't even enough to get it attention. 
I mean, look at Nintendo. Despite how much they hyped it up, and even though a majority of critics gave it 8s and 9s out of 10, Sin and Punishment Star Successor still got shrugged aside. Why? This was easily one of the best games of the last generation, and yet the only people who've heard of this game have only heard of it because of CJ and Quarter Guy. But I digress. Sin and Punishment Star Successor contains a lot that an action gamer would love. Let's start with the story. In a nutshell, one of the main protagonists, Isa, is sent to kill the other main protagonist, Kachi. But the two end up becoming allies and then have to go on the run from a military organization out to hunt both of them down. It's a very basic and arguably cliche story, but who really cares about storing a 3D equivalent to Toho? And by the way, that's no exaggeration! Seriously, look at this! This has got to be one of the most insanely challenging games I have ever played, as there are tons of lasers, missiles, enemies, and whatnot flying at you. Multitasking is a must in this game, as you have to make sure you're continuously dodging enemy onslaughts while at the same time shooting down enemies. But it's all satisfying at the end to see your glorious high score, just to find out there are a bunch of people on the online leaderboards with high scores twice your size. The design of this game is fantastic as well, both in the areas and especially the boss battles. These fights start crazy and just get crazier as the game goes on. And keep in mind, one of the first bosses in the game is a cloaked man who can shapeshift into the Shadow Devil's pet Stingray and a bunch of other sea creatures. It's absolutely insane! Which reminds me, if you get a lot of game overs while playing through this game, don't worry, it'll happen a lot more. But never does the game get to cheap levels of difficulty, and it motivates you to keep trying. I still really have to question how practically nobody bought this game. If you want a great challenge and some extra games new Wii library, Sin and Punishment Star Successor is an absolute must. You know, I've been waiting a long time for a day like this. After all, every time I've talked about Super Adventure Island 2 beforehand, it's been about that terrible final battle against the Phantom. Maybe it's time to talk about this game in a positive manner. So, where do I start? How about the gameplay? Unlike the other Adventure Island games, in which play like Sega's Wonder Boy series, Super Adventure Island 2 plays more like Zelda 2 for the NES. It's a side-scrolling adventure game with Metroid-style levels that are fully explorative and, for the most part, not linear, along with an overworld in which enemy encounters on a barren battlefield are possible. Though very much unlike Zelda 2, this game didn't get tons of odd looks or hate from fans, simply because the Adventure Island fanbase is pretty much non-existent. Another key element of the gameplay is the large amount of collectibles. It, due to this game being leveled as an RPG, for some strange reason, the amount of collectibles is immense, and the game focuses heavily on it, that and grinding for money to buy more equipment. Though I'll fully admit that it never really feels too tedious in this game, unless you're trying to buy the gold equipment. Seriously, that stuff is insanely expensive. The level design in this game is actually really impressive, especially for the Super Nintendo. The levels all follow specific themes, including a forest area, a volcanic island, and a series of tropical islands, which is this game's equivalent to Death Mountain. Yeah, I really hate Puka Puka Island. Not only is the level design and presentation great for its time, but the same goes with the soundtrack, with every song in the OST being quite memorable in its own right. The only real complaint that I have with this game is that the bosses are, for the most part, unimpressive. Especially that final boss. Yeah, yeah, Maverick likes the city to Odessa, and what else is new? Honestly, it's kind of surprising how long it's been since I last talked about what was widely considered to be my notable game of choice on this channel. But hey, it was my favorite game of all time, can you blame me? Though it's kind of sad how this game didn't get as much attention as it deserves. Granted, that's probably because the only people who bought it were people who already own a PSP, and judging the North American sales to PSP, that wouldn't be a lot of people. Either way, despite it being a fighting game in RPG franchise, Decidia to Odessa in Final Fantasy is one of the best things to ever happen to Final Fantasy, and proof that not everything went downhill after Final Fantasy X. Being based off an RPG series, the game's story is quite complex and could be seen as convoluted unless you actually pay attention to the story, but I have a feeling that with a game like this, most people didn't. After all, who plays fighting games for the story? This leads me to the gameplay, which is easily the best part of the game. Dissidia Duodecim is without a doubt the most unique fighting game I have ever played, as it cleverly throws RPG elements into the combat system, which surprisingly works really well. The game features a bravery system in which bravery attacks will increase the amount of damage you'll do to your opponent when you use HP attacks. This makes the game stand out immensely above any other fighting game on the market. Alongside this epic combat system is a wide range of playable characters from all 13 main series games. I did make a countdown about the roster with Zemer Shalaga. Except you shouldn't watch it. It was bad. 
But despite the terribleness of the countdown, the roster itself is still really impressive, with the only bad character in the game being, obviously, Shantoto. Add on some well-designed battle arenas, a lot of extra modes to add on to replay value, and an awesome collection of remixed Final Fantasy classics for the soundtrack. It's not my favorite game of all time anymore, that would be Fire Emblem Awakening, but it's still a fantastic game that I recommend to anyone who is able to get their hands on it. This is why I really hope that Square Enix releases the third Dissidia on consoles that people will get it on. Oh yeah, Square Enix said that they want to make a third Dissidia. Mission accomplished. Now it's time to talk about something I usually don't talk about. Rhythm games. I will admit that I didn't really like them when I was younger, but nowadays I've been finding myself enjoying them quite a lot more. And one of the games that has the biggest impact on my love for the genre goes to one of the best games on the 3DS. Rhythm Thief. Now we're talking. Rhythm Thief and the Emperor's Treasure is a rhythm game released on the Nintendo 3DS in 2012 by Sega, and is widely considered to be a cult classic. By the few people who have even heard of it! It's actually kind of sad because for a while, Rhythm Thief was my favorite 3DS game. Until Fire Emblem Awakening became a thing. But let's get back on topic. Rhythm Thief follows the adventures of a university student named Raphael, who is known by his identity of the legendary thief, Phantomar. In the game, Phantomar finds himself stealing a bracelet containing an emblem on the coin left behind by his father, who left him when he was younger. However, things get more suspicious when a mysterious girl named Marie shows up in his life with the same emblem on her violin, and when a man claiming to be Napoleon appears with an army of soldiers out to find a treasure called the Dragon Crown. Now Phantomar finds himself in the middle of a conflict that's been in play for years, and now must try to stop Napoleon's plans before they are unleashed. Yeah, the story sounds very much like it's from a Professor Layton game, but that's the kind of style they were going for. Even the art style and soundtrack are Layton-esque, but in my case, that's no problem. But now, let's talk about the most important part of the game, the gameplay. Rhythm Thief is full of different minigames, referred to as rhythms, which is where the rhythm gameplay kicks in. These rhythms take use of every single mechanic available on the 3DS. Even the gyroscope is used in a few levels. They're also extremely addicting to play and especially to listen to. Which brings me to the best part of the game, that soundtrack. Rhythm Thief's soundtrack is one of the best I have ever heard. With songs ranging from violin beauties to metal arrangements of classic organ songs, to songs that reference other Sega games like Samba de Amigo and Space Channel 5. I don't think I have anything else to say. If you have a 3DS, Rhythm Thief should definitely be part of your collection, as it's one of the best games available on the glorious handheld system. Now Sega, can we finally get that sequel we've all been wanting? Kitsune Hawk, I owe you one. I know what a majority of you are thinking. What the heck is this game? Well, a little history is needed. The Sengoku Basara series was Capcom's take on Dynasty Warriors, although the first game did terribly in North America due to Capcom's attempt to make it look as Devil May Cry-like as possible, which it actually isn't. So Sengoku Basara 2 was never released in North America, but Capcom decided to give the series a second chance by releasing Sengoku Basara 3 in North America under the name of Sengoku Basara Samurai Heroes. And let's just say, that was a fantastic idea! Sengoku Basara Samurai Heroes is honestly one of the best games I have ever played, and there are a lot of reasons why. Let's start with the story. The plot is based off Japanese history, or loosely rather, in which a war is being partaken. One of the protagonists, Ieyasu Tokugawa, is out to fight for peace in Japan, while the other protagonist, Mitsunari Ishida, is out to kill Ieyasu to avenge the death of his master, Hideyoshi. But honestly, while the story is well thought out, what makes this game shine so much is the gameplay. Just watch for yourself. I think it's safe to say that calling this game fun is a huge understatement. This game is addicting! Never before has slashing down entire armies within a few flashy attacks been this satisfying. And what's even better is the amount of variety between the playable characters you can use to do so. Of course you got Ieyasu and Mitsunari, but you also have characters like Magoichi the Gunslinger, Motochika the Pirate, and freaking Masamune! 
all these characters are extremely fun to play as and make the game that much more satisfying. But the best part of all? This game has co-op! That's right, you can slash down armies of soldiers with a friend. How can you not love that? Well, apparently people didn't, because it's number one. In fact, it's so overlooked that Capcom didn't release Sengoku Basara for North America because no one bought it. That's sad because Sengoku Basara Samurai Heroes is one of the most entertaining games I've played in a long time. I'm the Maverick Hunter, and Capcom, please bring Sengoku Basara 4 over to North America. If you publicize it enough, people will surely buy it.